Now I've got the cage dry fit one more time and I'm starting to contemplate the glue up strategy for this. And I get, I get really nervous when I have too many things to worry about at once during a glue up. So I'll use a slow setting glue, something that gives me a little bit more working time. But I find that some of the slow setting glues tend to be a little bit more messy and harder to clean up. So I'm trying to come up with a strategy that makes sense here. Now in the, the dry phase here, you can kind of see that these guys in the back, my back panel strips, they're a little bit loose. So if I turn it around, one of the things that I'm going to be gluing together are these back strips to the, uh, the shelf that lies above it, okay? So if I'm worrying about gluing those together while also trying to get these shelves glued into both sides and the top and bottom glued on, it's just too much for any, uh, any normal sane person to worry about. So what I'm gonna try to do is with everything dry clamped together and during this dry fit, I can actually uh, glue the back strips to the shelves at this stage. I won't put any glue near the ends because I don't want to glue the case completely closed, but the sides now give me perfect guidance and alignment to make sure that my shelves and the back strips are in the proper place. If I just took them out of the structure and tried to glue them together, clamp them down, get them as close as I can, trying to get them back into this case afterwards is probably going to be impossible, but at least this guides us and tells us exactly where those pieces need to be and holds them in the right orientation. All I need to do is apply clamping pressure uh, on both sides and pull that joint together and let it dry. So that's the next step. All right, so let's just start with the simplest one first, and that's the top. Bring that panel all the way down. I'm just going to apply a nice bead of glue right along the top here. And bring it up so it meets the top. We don't need a whole lot of clamping pressure here. Just make sure it makes good contact. Remember, it's a very thin piece of wood down there, so we don't want to crush it. Use that to distribute some clamping pressure. Avoid marring the top. Now I was just about to start to glue up for this piece and I realized that there was one more embellishment that I wanted to add. And I need to do it now while I still have access to the flat sides of these pieces. I wanna add a little uh, embellishment to the front at the top and the bottom. Uh, you can see with the marker here, it kinda shows you what I'm going for. I want two ebony strips to be inlaid and sit proud of the surface and we'll soften them up a little bit later. I'll go into detail on that in a bit. But in order to make this cut, it's gonna be a heck of a lot easier to do it now than to try and negotiate a router on top of this cabinet once it's already glued together. So with the pieces, you know, even though I've got this back piece on here, I still have one completely flat end and I could use this bearing guided slot cutting bit uh, with a quarter inch um, blade on it to make that cut all the way uh, across each section. Now, even though the slot cutter leaves us with nice square ends, there's still a lot of material here that needs to go. And I had to be a little bit cautious, so I didn't want to go right up to my line. There's about a quarter inch more uh, material that needs to come out of there. Uh, and again, the inside of this slot is sloped because it's a circular bit. So we've got to clean all that stuff out and uh, it's probably worthwhile for me to show you the whole process because this is something that's really going to come in handy in the future. So uh, let's get it up in the uh, bench vise and get started. Now the key to success here is understanding the way wood naturally wants to come apart. Normally it wants to go with the grain. So we always have to start doing cross grain cuts first to release those fibers so that we can be free to do our long grain cuts. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take my X-Acto knife and I'm going to extend my line and establish my new border, okay? This, where it stops here, is about a little over an eighth of an inch over from where I really want it to be. Okay, so I'm gonna take the X-Acto knife. I'm just gonna slice the fibers across the grain just between my pencil lines. I don't wanna go all the way just that center quarter of an inch right there. And that gives me a great guideline for my chisel. Put it right into that slot. A few good taps. You don't want to go too far, just to firmly establish that line. Now, since we've severed those fibers, it's safe to make cuts with the grain here. Now normally what you might start to do at this point is take a wider chisel, line it up with the inside of the mortise, and then chop in and establish those outside lines. 
Now, you could do that, but what's gonna wind up happening is all of this wood that's in the middle here is still very firmly attached. So when you put a chisel right up against the wall like this and try and establish a cut line, the wood in the middle is gonna push the chisel out a little bit. So instead of getting a perfectly square corner here, the outsides are gonna you know, splay out just, to, just enough to make it drive you crazy. So what I like to do before I make this cut is I hold on to the same chisel I had before and I'll make some relief chops here in the middle. Do as many or as few as you want. Well, at least three or four. Then I'll come across and pop those out. And what we've done is we've removed all of that wood that's going to cause us a problem. So if we take our wider chisel now, use the inside of the mortise as the guide. See, I kind of have it on a little bit of an angle here because I'm using the side as a, a reference. A few light taps now is all it takes to establish that inside edge. Same thing on the side facing me. Now we'll make that cut just a hair deeper. Okay. Now that that outside corner is established, we never have to worry about that again. Everything that happens below this, we've got a little bit more room for error uh, because you're not gonna see that stuff. You are always going to see the very top corner. So now I'll go back to the original location and I'll make a few more fresh cuts establishing that borderline even deeper now. Okay, and every time I do that, I'll come back through and I'll make two or three slices here just to break it up. Just makes it easier for me. And then I'll come across with a lateral cut here and remove some of that extra material. So we just go back and forth, cutting at the border. You may or may not notice that when I make this cut at the border here, I actually do have the chisel tilting this way about a degree or two. And that just ensures that there won't be any material at the bottom of the mortise interfering with uh, putting the piece of ebony in there. Now honestly, no one ever taught me this. This is just something that I kind of made up as I go along, just based on, you know, the principles of how wood works. So um, one of these days, maybe I'll have someone show me the right way to, uh, to chisel a mortise. But for now, this works just fine for me. So you keep going back and forth, back and forth, until you get it low enough that you, you start to look like it's pretty close to where you need to be. Okay, and at that point, I switch back to my wider chisel and I just extend my walls further down. If you happen to have a router plane, again, this little guy comes in real handy. And this will help you clean up the bottom when you get really close. That's it. Nice and square, square bottom, we're good to go. Now I'm gonna take the little ebony pieces and make just a very subtle round over on all four sides. And this way it just gives it a nice soft look that once it's embedded in the babinga, it'll just it'll look really natural, nice and soft, and it'll blend in with the piece. 
Now, getting something that's really square like this, but really tiny to look like this, is actually a little bit difficult because it's so small. I can't even fit it in my bench vise. So I'm gonna use a little machinist vise over here. And I've got a, a random orbit sander pad folded in half. That's gonna not only grip the piece, but it's gonna pad it from the metal jaws. Okay, and get that tightened in place. A block plane is perfect for removing the extra material at the corners. I follow up with a little sanding to blend everything together. And the final finessing has to be done with the ebony strip out of the vise. Now what we've done here is pretty subtle, but it's going to make a huge difference in the final look of the piece. Now if you'll excuse me, I am off to battle. So finally, it's time to glue up the case. Now, you'll notice I have a lot of blue tape on my side pieces here. The reason for this is if there's any glue squeeze out, I really don't want to have to try and get in there and clean all of that off. So this sort of, uh, I'm going to be as neat as possible, but this is going to help me just in case some of it squeezes out. It's going to save me some time and effort. Uh, also notice that everything is laid out right where I need it. I don't really want anything to be more than arm's reach away. If I have to run across the shop to get something in the middle of the glue up, that's valuable time that I'm wasting. So I like to have it all right here. I've got my dead blow hammer. I've got a bunch of squares set up. I've got all my clamps, all of my case parts right here. Uh, and I'll have my glue here in a second. Now, the other thing you'll notice, I have these little U-shaped blocks, okay? The clamping on these pieces is going to be a little bit awkward trying to get clamping pressure inside here. So I find that these little blocks will apply the pressure exactly where I need it and I'll be able to get my clamp uh, over the outside portion of that. What I'm going to use for glue is a slow setting epoxy and I'm not even sure how long it takes to dry and cure but it's it's pretty slow so the good thing is it's going to give me a good solid 15-20 minutes working time if I should need that much time because even when this case is together I'm still going to tweak and, and push here and there and try and knock it into the exact confirmation that I need it to be so everything is nice and square. So um, enough talking, let's get this puppy glued together. We'll start by putting glue in the dados and grooves. I can't remember exactly who it was, but somebody emailed me and said that they hate the fact that every woodworking show they've ever seen always skips the glue up and just basically doesn't acknowledge the fact that lots of things can go wrong at that stage of the game. So they requested that, uh, that I show a little more detail here and um, that's exactly what you're getting right now. I'm going to keep the bottom piece off for now because that will just further complicate the glue up. In fact, I probably should have waited to put the top on, this top piece here. Let's uh, start getting some clamping pressure on here. The first clamp goes right across, fits perfectly on that top through tenon. Okay, now I don't have any pressure going this way yet, so I don't want to really crank the heck out of it. Just get it in place. Now I could turn it up on its, on its feet. It really helps if you have a nice flat surface to work on here. The torsion box is good for that. Your table saw top with a piece of plywood on it might be a good option if you don't have an assembly table. Okay, well, we'll have some cleanup to do when it's all said and done, but that's unavoidable. Now, we will be adding screws. Just not yet. I really don't like putting cases together and relying on the screws to pull everything in place. I never find that I, I just find that I don't really get great results doing that. Now there's a double stick tape on the ends of these little clamping blocks and that's what's going to hold it in place for me. It's pressure sensitive so I give it a good push. Now what would be awesome is if this works. Would have worked. Needed longer clamps. 
Now, if you leave your, if you make yourself some extra glue, it can kind of be like a little stopwatch for you because as soon as you start to see the glue set in your little glue cup, you know you better get your butt moving because uh, your project is soon to follow. <laughs> will also be curing shortly. Although I find that the, the cup, the cup of glue, when there's more actual glue in the container like that, cures faster than it does on the joints, but still it's a good, a good heads up. Okay, so I'm gonna loosen the vertical clamps, give myself a little more pressure on the horizontals and then return the pressure to the vertical. And that just kind of allows the pieces to slip by one another and tighten things up a bit. All right. Well, nothing broke. Everything seems to be in place. I'm not ready to celebrate yet. We need to check for square. This is critical. Well, you know what? We lucked out. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. In this case, there's really nothing I can do to make this cabinet any better than it is in terms of being nice and square. So that's a good thing. Doesn't always work out that way. Okay. Now, when looking at the case in this orientation, you have to keep in mind that there could be a slight bow or cup in this top piece so that when you measure it like this, the cabinet may be as square as it's going to get. But if you see a slight little gap over in this area, it could just be, be because of this top piece. So don't go nuts, you know, trying to straighten it out if that's the reason. There's really not much you could do about that. Maybe apply some clamping pressure here, but you'll also distort the bottom if you do that too, if you run a clamp this way. So um, that's why it's a, good, it's a good idea to have all your stuff milled straight, flat, and square, because you don't really want to count on your glue up phase to fix milling problems. Now we kind of lucked out a little bit. There's really nothing for me to fix here in terms of uh, the squareness of the structure. But if there were a problem, what I usually do is I get these quick clamps because they've got a nice soft jaw on them. And I could run them from one corner to the other and just give it a light squeeze and it contorts it back into whatever the shape is uh, that, that you're looking for. And a lot of times, if it really is out of square and all the pieces are cut straight, if it's not because the pieces were cut wrong, You'll notice, let's say there's a little gap up here, you'll probably notice an opposing gap at the bottom that if you were to squeeze in one direction or the other, it'll straighten that out. And that's what I use, uh, use these for. So in all likelihood, if there were a problem, I'd put this thing on its back and then I would, I would use one of these clamps here to squeeze from corner to corner and just slowly dial it in until it's nice and, uh, nice and square. So, uh, but we lucked out here today and there's really nothing for me to, uh, to fix at this point. So. Yay me. And while the glue's drying, I'm gonna go ahead and add our little trim pieces to the top and bottom. Just a little yellow glue should be enough for that.